to staying the course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love It'll be an exciting way. time. Uh, today, the title of the message is M&M's. Uh, how many of you like M&M's, first of all? I love M&M's. I'm actually getting hungry. We may have to shut the service down early today because they're good, but it literally today stands for meditation and marriage. And I believe these things are extremely important, and we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 24, starting at verse 62. Genesis chapter 24, and we made it all the way to verse 62. Praise the Lord. We're going to finish this chapter today. Now, Isaac, what does his name mean again? Laughter. It, he laughs. I, how would you like to have a name, he laughs, or laughter? Yes? No? <laughs> Should we be a laughing people? And I'm not talking about holy laughter. That's a whole nother weird thing that goes on in some churches. But what I'm talking about is having the joy of the Lord. We should be a celebrant people, even in the midst of trial. Now, Isaac, how old is he here? 40 years old. Now, I used to think, well, man, why did he wait till he was 40? But here's what I found out. Back then, men lived a lot longer than they did subsequent years, and it began to decrease, and that was about the marrying age during this time. Did you know that? See, I said that just for you guys. <laughs> He's about 40 years old, but I don't know about you, but I could not wait that long. You know, for me, I had to get married as soon as I found my wife, soon and quickly, because I wanted to be pure before the Lord. So I got married quick. Doesn't mean you need to, but I did. Now notice where he goes or where he's coming from. Now Isaac had came from going to Beer Lahe Roy. What is that place? Who remembers? It literally means the well of the living one who sees me. Who called it that? Hagar. Very interesting. Turn back to Genesis chapter 16. Starting at verse 7. And remember, Hagar was what? Sarah's concubine, maid really. And Sarah took matters into her own hands. And since she wasn't getting pregnant, she told Abraham to go in to Sarah, or to go into Hagar, and to have her child that way. But in Genesis chapter 16, starting at verse 7, we read this. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mis mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be to many to count. And who are her descendants? Ishmael was her son. Many of the Arab nations came from Hagar and Ishmael. Continue on. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Ishmael. God hears is literally what it means because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone. Has that come true? Yeah, pretty much a lot of the events that are occurring with terrorism around the world are descendants from Ishmael. And everyone's hand will be against him. He will li live in the east of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahe Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bared. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of the son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. So today we find Isaac coming from that very well. Now, here's what's interesting. 
Guess where Isaac decided to live? What property did Abraham own in the promised land? We talked about it last week. A well and a tomb, a cave, a piece of property. And Isaac decided to live here. And we see that in chapter 25, verse 11 of the book of Genesis. It said, And it came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived in Beer Laheroi. So Isaac decided to live at this well, and we find ourselves again back in verse 62 of chapter 24. Now Isaac had come from going to Beer Laheroi, for he was living in the Negev. Who remembers what the Negev means? The south. Simply the south part of the country. Verse 63, Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. Any other words for the word meditate there? This is the only place in Scripture where this exact word is used. In fact, in the Jewish translation, they say Isaac went out to walk in the field. They don't even use the term meditate. The Septuagint uses the term meditate, and that's why we translate it meditate, but we really don't know what this word means. Literally in the Hebrew, it's sa or su ach. And su ach literally has the idea of walking with a brother and talking. Thus, the Jewish translation, he went to walk in the field. However, it means much more because the idea is to literally pray and many of the Jewish uh, Talmudic commentators said he went out to pray in the field. Do you meditate? Anyone here? Yoga, TM, some of you are like, what's TM? <laughs> Remember the Beatles? They made TM popular. It's called Transcendental Meditation. What's their goal in meditating with TM and Eastern religious schools? Nirvana. And it's to empty yourself, to empty your mind, and just be like nothingness. <laughs> you know. But meditation in Scripture is so much deeper. In fact, we need to be a people that meditate on the Word of God. Rather than emptying ourselves, we're filling our mind with the good things of God. Today, I believe it's important that Isaac, while he was waiting for his bride, and he knew the servant went to find a bride for him, did he know he found a bride yet? No. In fact, theoretically, he's in the field praying, Lord, please let her be pretty. You know, <laughs> you know he's just begging God, Lord, let her be a nice, awesome, godly woman. Do you pray that your children will meet a godly spouse one day? Folks, prayer is important. Start praying for your kids that God would protect them from people of the world that would pull them away from the goodness of God. Pray for a wife or a husband for your children. He went out to the field to meditate. Did Jesus ever go out to meditate and pray? Flip over, if you would, really quick to Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And Jesus often went off by himself to do what? To pray. Mark 1, 35, it says this, In the early morning, while it was still yet dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Getting alone to pray and meditate on the good things of God is something we need to do every day. Where do most Christians fail in their walk? It's in their daily devotions. It's spending time with Jesus. Early in the morning, that's one of my favorite times to do it. Why? Because I'm getting... No distractions. It's just me and God, and I can meditate on the Word of God. How important if Jesus went off to pray when He's fully God and fully man, is it that we go off and pray? Do you have a spot that you go? You know, some people ride their bike out on a trail, and they pray while they ride their bike. 
Some people walk. I love to walk and pray. For me, it's, it's just amazing as I take in some of the sights and the beauty of God's creation and meditate on the goodness of God while I walk and pray. Some people go in a prayer closet. But we definitely need to find a place to pray. Turn to Psalm chapter 49, starting at verse 1. I want to spend a little bit of time on meditation. Psalm 49. Should we meditate? I mean, when we're meditating on Scripture, literally find a relaxing position and breathe slow. Is that okay to do? You know, absolutely it is. In fact, the Mayo Clinic did a study and people that meditate are actually healthier. They get rid of allergies they get rid of cancer, they get rid of stress and heart problems and all these things by meditating. Is it okay to, Lord, you're so good, and breathe in and breathe out? Yeah, I think it's all right. You know, some have said, some Jewish scholars that said the very name of God, Yahweh, is breath. Can you hear it? <laughs> Yahweh. Every breath declares the glory and the majesty of God, and He sustains us breath by breath. Is it wrong to find a quiet place and relax before God and take some relaxing breaths and meditate on the things of God? It is not wrong. In fact, it is good for you. So many people are stressed and filled with anxiety in this life that when you find a place to meditate on the Word of God, it is refreshing to your soul and your body. Just like taking a Sabbath. Psalm 49, it says this, verse 1. Hear this, all peoples. Does that include us? Give ear all inhabitants of the world. Does that include us? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think. Both low and high, rich and poor together, my mouth will speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart literally shall bring forth understanding. You ever read a passage of the Bible and you just can't get it? It's like, what the heck does this mean? Meditate on it. Ask the Lord. It's in the meditation here that understanding comes. Flip back to Psalm 19, verse 7. I don't know about you, but I need understanding and wisdom from the Lord. Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. You ever feel soul sick? What do theologians call that? The dark night of the soul. It's this desert place where everyone has abandoned you, at least in your own mind. In fact, God is far from you. Even when you try to pray, it seems meaningless and you're in a desert, soul-sick state. The psalmist here said, man, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They're righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, much more than fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. and keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Equip me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquainted, acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the what? The meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my God and my Redeemer. What do you think about most? Think about it. <laughs> well, I think about what I think about most. No. <laughs> what do you think about most? When you're alone, when you're driving, what is the biggest thing you think about as children of God if you discipline yourself 
to begin to meditate on the goodness of God, on things that are pure and acceptable and righteous. And the very words of God themselves, if our thoughts are pleasing to God, guess what? Our actions and our words will be pleasing to God. Does that make sense? Out of the heart, what does the Bible say? The mouth speaks. Hey, out of the heart, that's where that well of living water should flow out of us to those around us. The things you meditate will be about are, is going to be what you become. If you think about the goodness of God, you will become more like Christ. We meditate on the Word of God. Not just weird things, but the Word of God itself. Notice we just read, your precepts restore my soul. Oh, wow. Soul sick? Meditate on the Word of God. Flip over to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. We all know this. By the way, I love Joshua. He was faithful, wasn't he? That's why he was allowed to lead the children of Israel across the river into the promised land. He was considered faithful. And what was he faithful in? Being a servant to Moses. What about Korah? Remember her? The other priests? They came against Moses and Aaron and said, Who are you? We hear from God too. We're going to do whatever we say God tells us to do. We don't have to submit nor listen to you. They paid for that rebellion, did they not? And they were godly people, no doubt. Yet Joshua never questioned. He followed and served Moses. There is blessing in submitting to the hierarchy that God has established. Folks, I want to tell you, as Christ submitted to the Father voluntarily, and men, we submit to Him, and women, you submit to your husband in marriage, there is blessing that occurs in submitting to that hierarchical structure that God has established. And if you rebel against it, rebellion is as what? The sin of witchcraft. It's trying to get your own power in. And Joshua, this faithful man, even start at verse 6, just because I love it. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall what? Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Meditate. We don't just do devotions. I got to tell you, devotions for me can be boring. I'll admit that. If I'm just going to say, okay, I have to read my three chapters. For me, I will speed read, I'll get through it, and I've done my religious duty. I can't do devotions like that. For me, I have to get before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to speak to my heart. I need a truth that I can hold on to today, that I can meditate on today. Then his word becomes hidden in my heart. Do you know what I mean? Turn to Psalm 1. You know, Isaac oftentimes gets a bad rap from commentators. <laughs> it's so funny to read them. They say, Isaac lived at home with his parents till he was 40. He was lazy. He never did anything. He never went anywhere. And a lot of commentators say this about Isaac. But man, I don't know about you, but what the little we know about Isaac and we don't know a lot, one thing, it seems like he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer, and because of that, he was great. He meditated on the things of God. How blessed is the man, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. You know, when I read the word, I will pause there and meditate. Am I walking in the counsel of the wicked. 
What does that mean? Am I listening to the voices around me rather than God's voice? Are there societal norms or trends that I'm listening to that's influencing the way I live my life? And if so, guess what I'm doing? Wow, I'm walking in the counsel of the wicked. Lord, show me if there's anything in me that is walking in the counsel of the wicked. And I meditate and I think about it and I pray about that verse and then I go on. Nor stand in the path of sinners. Hey, am I so tied with sinners that I am being pulled away from the body of Christ and the unity that I'm supposed to have there? Last week we talked about being unequally yoked. Hey, am I standing in the path of sinners or sitting in in the seat of scoffers. Do I listen to gossip? Do I relish in the scoffers around me? And that, oh, tell me a story. Oh, really? What? What'd they do? Oh, wow. Oh, they, oh my. They, oh, I'm so glad I'm not like that. Are you doing that? Verse 2, but his delight is in what? The law of the Lord. And in his law, he does what? Meditates day and night you want to have victory in jesus i gotta tell you it's not just getting up and reading a devotion and then going thinking you did your religious duty but it's meditating on the law of the lord on the word of god throughout the day if you have to write write the verse out so when i'm doing devotions i'm reading until that one verse sticks out and i'm like that's what i need i don't write it down but Maybe I should because it would remind me. And folks, if you can't memorize it, write it down. Take it with you. As you're driving in your car, singing worship songs to the Lord prayerfully, or, you know, country music, I don't know, whatever it is. You know, some of it's godly. <laughs> Have that verse and meditate on it. There is blessing that comes through meditating and fixing your mind on Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Have you ever had a day where you walked with God? Literally walked with God all day long. He was with you. You felt His presence. Those are the best days I've ever had in my life. Because everywhere I went, I went as a soldier of the cross. I went shining forth the light of Christ and it just welled up within me. The joy of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit, the strength that only God provides. And I meditated on the Lord every day. Believe me, the enemy will do whatever he can to distract you from keeping your mind fixed on Christ and godly things. Continue on. Verse 3. Hey, that man or woman or young person that meditates on the Word of God day and night, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does, he prospers. I don't know about you, but I need that. I need the Lord. We meditate to get understanding. You ever do that? And I encouraged you already, if you don't understand a verse, meditate on it. Seek the Lord about it. But in Psalm 119, why don't you turn there quickly, starting at verse 89. Psalm 119, by the way, that's the long chapter. And the whole Hebrew alphabet is in this chapter. If you want to memorize it, just start at the beginning. And all of those titles are literally portions of the Hebrew alphabet. How can you meditate on the word of the Lord? Sometimes I just read it, especially the Psalms. Like even this one. Oh, forever, O oh Lord. Your word is settled in heaven. Not one jot or tittle will be taken away from the word of God. Heaven and earth will be destroyed, but the word of God will last forever. It endures. Your word is amazing. God, king of the universe, creator of all things, wrote me a love letter and showed me how I can know him. And that's what this is. It's living and active. It is precious and pure. And when you meditate on it, you are blessed and strengthened and given wisdom. Continue on. Oh, your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You'll be faithful, Lord, I know. 
Your promises are good and I can rest in you. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts for by them you have revived me. Don't you love that? You want revival? Start meditating on the word of God. I'm yours, save me. For I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever mine. I have more insight, note this, than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. Hey, you want great insight? Start meditating on the Word of God. Every great man or woman that ever lived were men or women of prayer and meditation. I understand more than the aged because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from the evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From my, your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You need wisdom. You need direction. Start meditating on the word of God. You begin to recognize God's voice the more you meditate. Have you noticed that? Flip over, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting at verse 6. Why are we going there again, Pastor? I think we need to be reminded. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting at verse 6. Why do we meditate on the Word of God? I'll tell you why. It says this, even start at verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Do we need to do that? With all your mind? Do we need to do that? With all your soul? We need to do that. By the way, mind's not in this one. And with all your strength, continue on. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. That's meditation. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Guess what that's doing? It's causing a heart of meditation. You're teaching your children the Word of God. You're walking and abiding in Jesus Christ. And if you abide in Christ, you will do what? Bear fruit. But if you do not abide in Christ, you will do what? wither up and, and die. In fact, that parable, it says, and he'll, you'll be cut off and thrown into the fire. I want to abide in Christ. How do you do it? By meditating on the Word of God. I love Isaac. No matter what a lot of people say, because he was a man of prayer and meditation, and God blessed him, I believe, because of that. Meditation brings strength. Turn to Psalm 119.27. By the way, I love Psalm 119. Verse 27, even start at verse 25. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have told of many ways, and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. I have chosen the faithful way. Have you done that? The highway to holiness? I can remember there was a time where I thought I could be sinless and I really tried. Remember at communion this morning, I said, well, I'm keeping all the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm doing everything right. I'm guarding every thought. 
But then the Lord reminded me that, wow, you're just a wretched sinner saved by grace. It's such great truth. I've chosen the faithful way. I've placed your ordinances before me. I cling to your testimonies. Meditation. O Lord, do not put me to shame. I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Do you do that? That's meditation. Why do we meditate? Because his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Back to Genesis chapter 24. I encourage you this week, find a spot, get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, whatever you like, and get comfortable with your Bible. Turn everything else off. Just open a psalm. Just read and meditate on the goodness of God. If you do that, you will be blessed, the Bible says. You will prosper in all that you do, the Bible says, if you meditate on the Word of God. And the joy of the Lord will begin to flood your soul. Continue on. Verse 63, Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. Two things to note there. She wasn't veiled until she saw her future husband. So the whole idea of wearing the veils was constantly the tradition, simply isn't the case. Secondarily, our practice of putting a veil on at a marriage starts right here. Isn't that cool? I mean, it starts with Rebecca and Isaac. They haven't even seen each other. Could you imagine? You know, all of a sudden, it's like your wedding day and you've never met your spouse. Alex, what do you think? Dude, I don't know about you, but I'd be in the field meditating too. Lord, please, please. Let, you know. And then she comes veiled and you're like, oh, shoot. You know, it's like... Walking in with a bag over your head, you know, it's like, oh, Lord, are you sure she's the one? I love it. I'm sorry. She veiled herself. 66. The servant told Isaac all the things that had done, and this was confirmation. Oh, I went to the well, Isaac. I put a fleece out before the Lord. I said, man, whoever comes and uh, when I ask for a drink, they give me a drink and then offer to water my camels, which would take hours of hard labor. Whoever does that, that's the one. And then he watched her just to make sure, gazing and praying. So Isaac received that. Then Isaac brought her into his, uh, his mother Sarah's tent and he took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You know, I believe that Isaac, when he was in that field, the Lord said, don't worry. Hey, the one that Abraham's servant is bringing, she's the one for you. Would God do something like that? Absolutely. It's confirmation. The puzzling thing about verse 67 is what? If something puzzles you about that verse, what is it? Dude, there was no marriage ceremony. They just simply went in a tent, got to know one another, and they were married. And we have many people today that say marriage simply is when you have sex with somebody. We don't need to go through a ceremony. And folks, that's a lie from the pit of hell. In John chapter 4, what do we find at the woman at the well? She came up to Christ and, you know, they were talking and he said, woman, you've had five husbands and the man that you're living with now is what? Not your husband. So it has not, no, it's not just having sex. That does not mean you're married. If you're single today, do not have sex and do not believe the lie that, well, if we do that, we're married in God's eyes. 
That's a lie from the pit of hell. You are not married, just as the woman at the well was not married, even though she was having sex and living with the guy. That is not marriage. Romans chapter 14, right, Tim, I believe? It says we're to obey the laws of the land. 13? 13 or 14. We're to obey the laws of the land. And in this land, you're not legally married until you have that certificate in your hand and either a judge or a clerk or a pastor pronounces you husband and wife. Folks, marriage, by the way, ceremony did come in Malachi chapter 12. We're told that marriage is a covenant between two people and God. In fact, in Judaism, you would have to sign a contract called a ketula. And this contract was the marriage covenant that was legally binding. The Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall be what? One flesh. Folks, marriage is a sacred covenant between you, your spouse, and God. And it should not and cannot be broken except for two things. Immorality, or if a non-believer leaves a believer. That's the only two reasons. May the church start honoring that as well. Amen? Isaac, did he ever divorce Rebecca? No, he didn't. Even though he had never met her, he didn't fall in love. He didn't do all of this stuff because love is so much more than that goo-goo feeling. It is a commitment that no matter what, I'm going to love you, I'm going to be with you till death do us part. And folks, we need to strengthen marriages. Do you see marriages falling around you, especially Christian marriages? You need to grab them and you need to show them in the word of God that they cannot get a divorce. They have to stay committed. Meditation and marriage. We need both. Some of you need to pray and meditate a lot because your marriage is so rocky. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Alex, don't laugh at me. Worship team, come on up. M&M's. Every time you eat M&M's, think about meditation and marriage. We need to do both. Both are good things. Comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week.